The z-scores and probabilities that we have considered so far are limited to situations in which the sample consists of a single score. Most research studies involve much larger samples, such as n equals 40 children with appendicitis or n equals 500 people with seasonal pollen allergies. In these situations, the sample mean rather than a single score is used to answer questions about the population. We're going to extend the concepts of z-scores and probability to larger samples and introduce a procedure for transforming a sample mean into a z-score. In these situations, the sample mean rather than a single score is used to answer questions about the population. We're going to extend the concepts of z-scores and probability to larger samples and introduce a procedure for transforming a sample mean into a z-score. A researcher would then be able to calculate a z-score that describes an entire sample. As always, a z-score value near zero indicates a central representative sample, while a z-value beyond plus or minus two indicates an extreme sample. Thus, it's possible to describe how any specific sample is related to all the other possible samples. In addition, we can use the z-score values to look up probabilities for obtaining certain samples no matter how many scores the sample contains. It's usually possible to obtain thousands or even millions of different samples from the same population. Under these circumstances, how can we determine the probability for obtaining any specific sample? Additionally, although it's intuitively reasonable that sample size is an important factor in determining how accurately a sample represents its population, we need to quantify exactly how sample size influences the probabilities. In general, the difficulty of working with samples is that a sample provides an incomplete picture of the population. Suppose a researcher selects a sample of n equals 25 students from a state college. Although the sample should be representative of the entire student population, there will almost certainly be some segments of the population that are not included in the sample. Furthermore, samples are variable, they're not all the same. If you take two separate samples from the same population, the samples will be different. They will contain different individuals, they will have different scores, and they will have different sample means. Given that thousands of different samples can come from one population, it may seem hopeless to try to establish some simple rules for the relationships between samples and populations. Fortunately, however, the huge set of possible samples forms a relatively simple and orderly pattern that make it possible to predict the characteristics of a sample with some accuracy. The ability to predict sample characteristics is based on the distribution of sample means. The distribution of sample means is the collection of sample means for all the possible random samples of a particular size that can be obtained from a population. To illustrate this, let's consider a population that consists of only four scores, 2, 4, 6 and 8. We're going to use this population as the basis for constructing the distribution of sample means for n equals 2. For this example, there are 16 different possible ways to choose two values from this population of four scores. They're all listed in this table. The sample means for each of the 16 different possible samples is also listed. The 16 means can then be placed in a frequency distribution histogram. This is the distribution of sample means. We can use this distribution of sample means to answer probability questions about samples. For example, what's the probability of obtaining a sample mean greater than 7? Things to note about the distribution. The mean of the sample means equals the mean of the population. The shape looks normal, and we can use this distribution to answer questions about probabilities. The construction of this distribution of sample means is for an overly simplified situation with a very small population and samples that each contain only n of two scores. In more realistic circumstances with larger populations and larger samples, the number of possible samples will increase dramatically and will be virtually impossible to obtain every possible random sample. 
Fortunately, it's possible to determine exactly what the distribution of sample means will look like without taking hundreds or thousands of samples. Specifically, a mathematical proposition known as the Central Limit Theorem provides a precise description of the distribution that would be obtained if you selected every possible sample, calculated every sample mean, and then constructed a distribution of those sample means. It's brilliant because it describes the distribution of sample means for any population, no matter what shape, mean or standard deviation. And by the time the sample size reaches n equals 30, the distribution is almost perfectly normal. The essence of central limit theorem is that for any population with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, the distribution of sample means for sample size n will have a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma divided by the square root of n and will approach a normal distribution as n approaches infinity. From our previous example you can see that the distribution of sample means is centred around the mean of the population from which the samples were obtained. The mean of the distribution of sample means is equal to the mean of the population scores. In this example they both equal 5. The mean of the distribution of sample means is called the expected value of x bar. To completely describe the distribution of sample means, we need one more characteristic, variability. Variability equals the standard deviation for the distribution of sample means. It's identified by the symbol sigma x bar and it's called the standard error of the mean, or sometimes just the standard error. The standard error provides a measure of how much distance is expected on average between a sample mean and the population mean. Remember that a sample is not expected to provide a perfectly accurate reflection of its population. Although a sample mean should be representative of the population mean, there typically is some sampling error between the sample and the population. The standard error measures exactly how much difference should be expected on average between a sample mean and the population mean. In other words, the standard error provides a method for defining and measuring sampling error. The standard error is an extremely valuable measure because it specifies precisely how well a sample mean estimates its population mean. The magnitude of the standard error is determined by the size of the sample and the standard deviation of the original population the sample came from. The primary use of the distribution of sample means is to find the probability associated with any specific sample. The distribution of sample means presents the entire set of all possible sample means so that we can use proportions of this distribution to determine probabilities. The formula for standard error expresses the relationship between standard deviation and sample size. The following examples demonstrate this process. Example 1. A population of SAT scores forms a normal distribution with a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. If you take a random sample of n equals 25 students, what's the probability that the sample mean will be greater than 540? So the first thing to do is calculate the standard error, which is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So 100 divided by the square root of 25, which equals 20. We're then going to change the sample mean into a z-score. So 540 minus 500 divided by the standard error, which is 40 divided by 20, which gives us a z-score of plus 2. Looking up the z-score of 2 in the unit normal table, gives us a probability of 0.0228, or in other words, 2.28%. This means that if you choose a random sample of 25 students, there's only a 2.28% probability that their SAT scores are going to have a sample mean greater than 540. Example 2. Let's say a population of IQ scores forms a normal distribution with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. What's the probability of obtaining a sample mean greater than 105 from a sample of n equals 9 people? So again, we calculate the standard error first. 15 divided by the square root of 9 equals 5. We're then going to change the sample mean into a z-score. 
So 105 minus 100 divided by the standard error equals 5 divided by 5, which is a z-score of 1. Looking at 1 in the unit normal table gives us a probability of 0 0.1587, or 15.87%. That's the probability of choosing a sample of 9 people who have a mean greater than 105 in terms of IQ. Example 3. Let's say again we have a population of IQ scores that forms a normal distribution with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. What's the probability of obtaining a sample mean greater than 105 from a sample this time of n equals 36 people? Again, the first thing is to calculate the standard error. 15 divided by the square root of 36 equals 2.5. We're then going to change the sample mean into a z-score so 105 minus 100 divided by the standard error is 5 divided by 2.5, which gives us a z-score of plus 2. Looking 2 up in the unit normal table gives us a proportion of 0.0228, or 2.28%. This makes sense. Comparing example 2 and example 3, it should be less probable to have a sample of 36 people with an average IQ of greater than 105 than just having a sample of 9 people with an average IQ of greater than 105. Example 4. A population of heart rates form a normal distribution with a mean of 75 and a standard deviation of 10. If n equals 4 are selected as a sample, what proportion of the samples will have means less than 80? Again, our first step is to calculate the standard error. So 10 divided by the square root of 4 equals 5. Changing the sample mean into a z-score, 80 minus 75 divided by the standard error gives us a z-score of plus 1. Looking at plus 1 in the unit normal table gives us a probability of 0 0.8413, or 84.3%. It's quite probable that choosing 4 people from a sample, their average heart rate is going to be lower than 80 beats per minute. Example 5. Again, a population of heart rates form a normal distribution with a mean of 75 and a standard deviation of 10. If we choose n equals 16 people this time as a sample, what proportion of the samples will have means less than 67? Again, calculate the standard error first. 10 divided by the square root of 16 equals 2.5. We're then going to change the sample mean into a z-score, so 67 minus 75 divided by the standard error which is negative 8 divided by 2.5. That's going to give us a z-score of negative 0.64. Looking up 0.64 in the unit normal table gives us a proportion of 0.2611, or 26.11%. That's the probability that if we choose a sample of 16 people, their average heart rate is going to be less than 67 beats per minute. In general, as the sample size increases, the error between the sample mean and the population mean should decrease. Notice that the size of the standard error decreases in these distributions as the sample size increases. With respect to visual displays of data, error bars are used to represent variation. Figure 72 is a bar graph of mean serum cholesterol levels from three separate samples of n equals 25 each. The bars of three different heights and the error bars of three different widths, which reflects the fact that all three samples, which were taken from the same population, have three different sample means and three different sample standard deviations. Figure 73 is a bar graph of combined mean serum cholesterol levels from these three samples. The bar height represents the overall mean, while the error bars reflect the standard error of the mean. The smaller the error bars, the smaller the variability. So the small error bars in figure 73 indicate that the three samples of figure 72 are fairly similar to each other.